The following podcast is a Simpronto Media production. Welcome to the Waste Away Podcast. Hey guys, I'm so excited to introduce you to our next guest, and he is one of the founders of Divine Elements, and you've got a team of people with you that work with you, is that right? We do, yeah, we've got, well, my, my wife and myself uh, basically started this business over 10 years ago, and we've got another doctor on staff and uh, about three support staff uh, helping to, to run the show. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about your practice. Tell us about yourself and your, your whole practice. Yeah. So, I mean, our practice was really birthed um, because my wife and I, we love to travel. And so we were actually planning on working in a, a multidisciplinary detox center in Costa Rica after, after we graduated from naturopathic school. And uh, life has a funny way of steering you in the direction that it wants to go. And, and we ended up moving back to Vancouver where we did our naturopathic training and uh, opening up practice in, our, in, the, in the place or the area that, that I uh, lived in when I was going to school. And so our practice has evolved like, like we all do, you know, over time, it's changed into many different areas. We started off doing just sort of basic naturopathic treatments and then moved into specializing in or expertise in uh, hormone replacement therapy and understanding things from, um, uh, you know, a longevity or anti-aging point of view, uh, also from a weight management point of view. And then, um, I don't know, over the last three to five years, we've been diving more into uh, detoxification and, and really ramping up the, the fasting protocols in our clinic and addictions and recovery. And we're just about to launch uh, what's called a longevity lab where we're bringing in hyperbaric therapy and red light and saunas and all these other supportive tools that are going to support people on their journey to, towards optimal health and longevity. And now <clears throat> I love on your website how Sonia is your wife's first name, mm-hmm. right? So like you have on there, like Dr. Sonia Jensen, she specializes in like women's hormone health, you know, cell yep. health. And then you, you kind of have your specialties of like heavy metal detox and you kind of ha- each have your own little specialties between you two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's definitely. Awesome. Well, let's talk about fasting and let's talk about people that you see who maybe have tried fasting and they're now in a lull. So they might say, you know, and we see this a lot. We get questions all the time where people will quickly lose 20 or 30 pounds like that. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing ever. But now they've got 20 more pounds to lose and they, they are doing the fasting, but that's not enough. So mm-hmm. what, what are you seeing of some of the issues that are going on there? Yeah, well, I mean, there's so many different layers to it and we're all so unique in our individual biochemical pathways or genetics or our environmental stimuli or our stressors, uh, our microbiome. I mean, there's a lot of different factors that, that influence us as individuals. And uh, at the same time, I mean, we're, we're just, we're a result of our behaviors and our belief systems about ourselves, right? And often with, when people hit a plateau, it's often, are, are you actually doing it properly? You know, I mean, one of the tools that we teach people is if you're not getting obje- more objective in your journey with fasting, like looking at your numbers, finding what level of ketone you're at or what your blood sugar is at. Um, I mean, with all our clients, we run them through a series of blood tests to find out where are they hormonally stunted. Maybe they're running insulin dominance, though the first 20 pounds is pretty easy. And, um, you know, finding where someone's stuck is really, is, is, is our job as, as physicians to help people find their way through. So, because, you know, the normal, the normalcy of a lot of the stuff that we all try, it could be any diet, it could be any new exercise regimen. We sort of, we get to a point where we go, I think I've learned all I can and on my own. And now this isn't working anymore. So I'm going to do something else. Mm-hmm. Instead, we have a chance or an opportunity to go, you know, what? I'm going to dive a little deeper. I'm going to look for mentorship. I'm going to look for a doctor that knows this. I'm going to look for a coach. I'm going to listen to some more podcasts, especially ones on fasting like Chantal Ray's, you know, whatever it may be that we need to just dive a little bit deeper because there's something moving, uh, preventing you from moving forwards. <clears throat> Oh my gosh, I love that so much because I have a part in my book and I call it shiny ball diet syndrome. (laughs) And it's true because what happens is people are like, oh, they're doing good, they're doing good. And then they get into a lull and then they go up now I'm going to try this crazy diet. Now I'm going to go on Jenny Craig. Now I'm going to go on Atkins. Now I'm going to do this. And then they just go from one thing to another. And so they just get 
kind of crazy because they're jumping into something else because they're in that lull. Oh, totally. I mean, this is this is the you know the modern phenomenon of us being like you said. I love I love that analogy. <laughs> I mean, we're constantly looking for the next shiny object. I mean, it's so true. You know, we we forget just what, what develops us as human beings is just constant discipline. I, I mean, I don't know who quoted this, but you got to put ten thousand hours in to master any technique, right? And I take it back for people. I, I walk through people, people, walk this through with people in, in what we call the four levels of learning. And the first level is just this complete place of complete ignorance. You know, we call it, it's unconscious incompetent. And then you move into the next level, which is conscious incompetence, which is basically, I know something's wrong, but I have no idea what to do about it. And then you, and then you move into conscious competence where you start to, oh, I'm getting some momentum here. This is starting to make sense, uh, but it requires willpower and focus and determination, discipline. And that's where we sort of fall back into our old behaviors. And like I said, if we're not changing our belief system or identity of who we see ourselves to be, it's really hard to keep a momentum going into the fourth level, which is unconscious incompetence, which is basically like, I don't, I just don't even consider that food, you know, put enter McDonald's, Burger King, whatever you want um, into that line there and go, that's just not food. So of course it doesn't go in my body. Instead, people go, well, how do I bring my old, my old habits and behaviors in to work it into this new strategy? Well, that's where this has to be turned into a lifestyle change, as you know. You know, it's, it's not just about, oh, let's do the next best diet. I don't consider intermittent fasting a diet. I, I literally look at it as a way to serve our cellular homeostasis. We need autophagy and we need building. You know, and that's, that's the dance that we all have to, to implement to, to sustain and acquire long, long-term health. Hey guys, I don't know about you, but if you are just feeling so tired throughout the day and just feeling restless at night, then I want you to try something called Energy Bits. Each package is has spirulina or chlorella algae. They're plant-based and they have zero sugar, 40 nutrients, five grams of protein. And so you are gonna feel great taking them. So go to energybits.com and then you'll get 20% off if you put the promo code Chantel. That's C-H-A-N-T-E-L. Well, I love that you have an e-fasting book on your website. Mm. Everyone needs to go and check that out. Give listeners a little hint of something that's in that free ebook. You know what? I think because what, what we're actually leading people through in that, that ebook or, or opening people the ideas is uh, block fast. And so it goes beyond... You know, and again, you mentioned this begin at the beginning, you know, what happens when people get to that level where maybe they've hit a plateau? Well, you got to you got to create more adaptability in the body. And so it's encouraging people to look at the data, look at the science, which I, I list a ton of great information in there just about this is safe. This is normal. And we're meant to go through longer periods of, you know, uh, known stressors that we're applying on our own body that are going to elicit a change. And uh, so it's, it's science, it's really easy, easily uh, digestible, easy to read, easy to implement. And if nothing else, it's going to stir and plant a seed in someone to think, you know, what? there's, there's something to this. I'm going to, I'm going to look a little bit deeper. And that's my hope with the book. Now, what is the longest fast you've ever done? And do you have any tips or tricks to kind of make it easier to do an extended fast? Well, it's funny because uh, every quarter we walk a group through uh, what's what we call the metabolic fix. And we just finished, uh, I just finished my five day fast two days ago. Mm. And so once a quarter, I do a, a block fast of a varying length, five, five to 10 days. But my longest straight water fast was 10 days. My longest sort of modified what we call partial fast was 12 days. Um, and uh, you know, the, so the strategies to move through is Honestly, so much of this is in the preparation, you know, so everything you're teaching, leading people in through understanding the role of intermittent fasting and eventually checking their numbers and things like that. That's a segue into creating that metabolic flexibility to be able to tap in those, those fuel cells that have been sitting dormant in hibernation waiting to be used. And then once you set up that structure within the body, the organization and stimulus into the mitochondria to rev up that cellular energy, now you're ready to you know, dabble into some longer fasts and maybe for, I mean, how we implement it is basically move people into 24 hour fast. And then from there we go into a two or three day fast and then up to a five day. And, 
And the reality is, I mean, if people get to day three, because day two to three suck for the most part, they're, they're quite challenging for many people. Uh, the autophagy process that's doing all that cellular cleaning can sometimes come with its symptoms like headaches and it could be palpitations, different things as you're, as you're shedding fat in your body, you're releasing toxicity. So there, there are some challenges. And, uh, but once you get in day four and five, I mean, the stream of consciousness that comes through the brain, because you're, you're getting all this new juice and 75% of your energy, um, when you're in a four or five day fast is coming from ketones and it's just surging into your brain. So the, the illumination of you and your power, your internal power, your, you have such gratitude for the gift of being alive in this human form to, to see what happens when we start being and stop doing and so there's, there's many, many, many gifts in a block fast that, that, uh, that take your, you know, your lifestyle practice of, of intermittent fasting into a whole new, whole new uh, area. So when you're saying block fasting, what do you mean when you say that? Yeah. So there, we have different ways of doing fasting. Uh, block fasting just means that we're going, we're actually defining a timeline longer than you know the 16 8 or whatever has been popularized by by a restricted meal window so the because the reality is that kind of the way i said before intermittent fasting for me is just how we're supposed to be eating i i according to like dr jason fung and some of the other experts in the field this isn't really true fasting until you've gone past 36 48 hours and so because what's happening the met metabolism is completely changing right? Then the first 24 to 36 hours, you're starting to break down some of the inflamed tissue, some of the proteins in the body and people go, Oh no, I'm going to lose muscle. This is going to, I'm going to reduce my metabolism. I'm just going to gain all the weight back. And you know, they get in it's fear mode. But what happens actually is as you start to break down some of that really problematic inflamed tissue, the, the, the micro proteins, the scar tissue, the, you know, some of the microbes and other things interfering with our health, then you're starting to and then finally, glucose is starting to drop a little bit more. Ketones are trying to rise. And that's that transition zone that's so challenging for people. But eventually, your metabolism is actually increasing when you're fasting. This is what people don't understand. You're actually boosting your metabolism. You're raising levels of epinephrine to release and cause more glucose to be released when needed. But essentially, growth hormones rising, which is allowing for a fat metabolism state. When we're stuck in insulin dominance from the you know constant food flurry going into our mouths throughout the whole, you know, throughout the day, every day, most of us, unfortunately, on that plan are stuck or will eventually be insulin resistant and pre-diabetic. And you can't burn fat when you're pre-diabetic or insulin resistant. It won't happen. So this process maintains muscle mass, burns fat. So you can do this with straight water. You can do this like a bone broth type fast. You can do uh, Walter Longo popularized uh, the fasting mimicking diet, which is, you know, five days a month, uh, whatever frequency someone may want to do, where you eat uh, around 800 calories of, of, of vegetarian only meals, um, which works fantastic. Uh, and then the partial fast, which we sort of use a lot in our clinic as well, which is utilizing the tool of intermittent fasting, you know, having essentially one meal a day vegetarian, and it's going to be closer to about 500 calories, maybe in between 500 and 800 calories. And that's for five days in a row and lots of different strategies. And so someone's first fast, you might want to lean in with a partial fast or fasting mimicking diet or bone broth or, you know, or that version before going to a true water fast. Mm. I love that because there are people who need that transition. And I love the term partial fasting. So give someone an example of what they would eat on that partial fasting. So you're saying you want it to be vegan. Like, have you done a partial fast yourself? And what would, what would you have eaten? Yeah. Oh, you bet. I mean, last was it last year. I did a challenge on myself every month. I was going to do some version of a fast. And so I did water fasting. I did Ayurvedic fasting. I did bone broth fasting. I did, you name it. So yeah, I've done, I've done, I think I've done it all. I'm sure there's can lots you, can more Can you talk there. about the different ones you've done? Cause that would be yeah. great. Sure. So, I mean, water fasting, I like the most because I'm getting, you're getting the most autophagy. You get the most brain clarity. Your ketones rise the most. You're getting so much cellular repair in a water fast. Um, and, and so for me, that's, that's my favorite. It's not my favorite on day two to three. That's where I get a little more challenged, a little more lethargic when, when that energy diversion is starting to change. But um, yeah, uh, to be honest, I don't really like bone broth fasting because I get hungry. Uh, mm -hmm. Water fasting literally turns off those switches. Um, partial fasting is great. And to be honest, I mean, I partial fast 
you know, at least three, four days in my week. Cause I'm, I'm just eating once a day, you know, three, four days a week when I'm at work, I don't, I don't eat during the day. I'll just eat when I get home with my family. Um, so I, I love partial fasting cause it's, it's so easy. And my wife, Sonia, when she does it, her numbers in, in a partial fast are almost similar to mine when I do a water fast. So there's some people that just have that, or maybe it's a genetic switch. I know women are more efficient typically at uh, raising ketone levels. I mean, every, every woman in our metabolic fix group that we, that we teach, I mean, their numbers are like way better than mine on, you know, their day two and three. And it takes me like five days and of, of a water fast to match their like day two or three of a partial fast. So, and I, th and there's some evidence to show that for women, the reason that is, is because women are capable of feeding another body. And so you've had to be able to tap into your reserves a lot more effectively to, to feed a baby. Um, so maybe that's part of it. I don't, I don't know. Hey guys, I have a free smoothie book that has over 20 recipes that are super unique, like broccoli bonanza, great green smoothie, and mojito madness, and so much more. They are really amazing and you're gonna love them. And the best part is it's totally free. So go to chantelrayway.com slash free recipe and you'll get the book and tons of other free recipes. Or just look in the show notes and click there. I feel like, I personally feel like guys have an easier, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I have an easier time. It's funny because I have done so I really don't even know anyone who's done more fasting than I have. Mm -hmm. I've done so many different fasts, two day fast, three day fast, a five day fast, um, tw I do 24 hour fast all the time. Um, but the thing is, is that there are days what, what I have finally learned and it's taken me a while is where I am on my menstrual cycle. Oh, so yeah. I just literally tried to do a 20, a 48 hour fast. Cause I was like talking to a friend, I was like, let's do a 48 hour fast. And I did it at a time where it was like right around my period. And I already know better than that. I didn't even make it. So for me not to make a 48 hour fast, someone who does fasting all the time, I was just like, I was in such a bad mood. I was getting grumpy and I was like yelling at everyone. I'm like, that's it. I'm eating. Oh, I love it. So, so for me, what I've learned is if I'm going to do that fast, I have to do it on, if day one is my period, I'm going to do it somewhere between day 15 and day 21 mm. are my best chance of me doing any kind of longer fast. I can do a 24 hour fast any time of the month. That's yeah. no problem. But once I go over 24 hours, I need to be very conscious of what time of the month it is for me. So that's where I feel like you guys have it a lot easier. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's my wife, you should have her on the podcast. So she, yes, she dials in the, the, the female aspect of fasting in such a beautiful way. But yeah, we, we tell our patients don't fast the week before your period, unless you want, you know, unless you want your husband to run away from you because it's, it's not a good place. And so Sonia is just like you, she's experiment, experimented with that as well. And it, it's, it's not fun being around her. <laughs> so yeah, you, you, you have definitely more um, of a time restriction monthly uh, than men do. And I think, you know, to, 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 to your point from before, men have an easier time from, yeah, like a cyclical version. Uh, men also tend in general, not all men, but men tend to in general have higher levels of uh, lean muscle mass and testosterone. So they can, they can burn through typically fat faster. It's just that women tend to get higher ketones on average from what we've seen. And so I think that's probably where there's a little bit of that difference in, um, in gapping. Women just typically should have more fat on their body than, than men. And I think that's where there's some of the, the maybe even the challenges with, with weight loss or wasting away, as you say. <laughs> so, so, okay. So when you're doing your partial fast, you're saying, okay, I'm going to just eat one meal a day. I'm going to make sure it's like 800 calories or less. And, or is it 500 calories? This, yeah. Partial fast is closer to 500. Yeah, 500 it's like, calories. it's like the most unsatisfying meal you could ever imagine. Right. right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so give me some yeah. examples. Give me some okay. examples. So basically, like I said, vegetarian only. Yeah. So vegan, essentially, as you said, I mean, you don't want any other, you don't want any proteins in. I mean, it turns out that I think anything over 20 grams of protein is going to kick you out of autophagy. So the easiest way to do that is just to do a vegan soup. Essentially, you could just, you know, broccoli, cauliflower, all the above ground veggies. We don't use any of the root vegetables in any of the, the meals. 
typically during a partial fast. So it's just all the leafy greens, the, yeah, like I said, the above ground veggies, making soups are the easiest way to do it, but it could be a little stir fry. Um, it could be something like that, you know, you know, for five days. Um, or some of the dishes we made. I mean, and they're usually what we, I mean, there's different ways to do it. The, the fasting mimicking diet has sort of a strategy to sort of increase carbohydrates and then restrict them and then sort of bring them back in. But um, generally speaking, it's unsatisfying because you're not eating to full like you would say in an intermittent fasting schedule. You're really trying to be mindful of keeping around that 500 calorie intake so you can really dip, dive deeper into to autophagy and, and raise those ketones. So hopefully that, Gave yeah. you a bit of an idea. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about some things, other issues that you're seeing. So let's say that you go to see someone and let's say maybe they have a thyroid issue because that, that is one thing that I hear from people a lot. So let's say they're taking thyroid meds. Okay. Let's, let me back up for just a second. Cause that's a big question we get yeah. for people who are on thyroid meds and now they're trying to do a longer fast, say a three day fast or five day fast. And now because they're taking those thyroid meds, they're not feeling good. So while they're in their fast, like maybe their thyroid is starting to work more. And so that thyroid medication that they were taking is not, not right. Yeah. The not right dosage while they're fasting, you know? Right. To be honest, I mean, we haven't seen too many difficulties with uh, dosage adjustments in, in fasting. And it also depends on how they led into a fast. So I wouldn't take someone who's never done any fasting and put them into a block fast. Um, before they're, they're metabolically ready as until we could see that their body is capable of utilizing ketones, that they could actually feel that they're starting to feel some of the positive benefits of, of intermittent fasting. So let's, let's imagine someone's gone through that journey and is there and is, is ready for that. You know, on the, on the way there, we don't, I'm just trying to think of like dosage adjustments. I mean, because we're usually monitoring blood work too. And so that's usually one of our best gauges, but here's, here's an example. When people are fasting, it's common, unfortunately, to sometimes feel like heart palpitations. And so it's hard to tell what's coming from the medication, what's coming from the fasting experience, um, from like, say, revving up your metabolism too aggressively. So uh, yeah, it's, it's so individual, to be honest. So no, we don't do a lot of changing to the meds unless they're on ridiculously high levels of thyroid medication and they need to be toned down anyways. But like I said, I think most of that tapering would, would be done prior to an actual block fast. So let's talk about some of the typical causes for heart palpitations. Mm -hmm. I've been seeing this more and more. We just had one of the guys who works at our company. He's like, I'm, I have to leave early. He's like, I'm going to urgent care. And we're like, why? He's like, I'm having massive heart palpitations and I don't know what it was. And I can't remember what his reason was. Maybe it was like low iron or um, something. I can't remember, but he came back and was like, I'm fine. It was, mm -hmm. it was this or whatever. So, but I'm hearing more and more with people having heart, heart palpitations. So what would give us a list of what are some of those causes? Yeah, I mean, one of the big ones is just epinephrine starts to rise when we're in a longer fast because it's trying to mobilize glucose for us because our ketones haven't risen yet. Or maybe we just, we're not realizing or recognizing our underlying, you know, traumas or stressors and we're getting triggered in multitude of different ways and we're feeling overwhelmed. So anxiety is rising and they're there with it, that epinephrine surge. Um, so I think that's probably the, the most common. It should be the most common just based on basic physiology. And then the other one would, could just be electrolyte deficiency, you know, as you're in this kind of relates back to your thyroid question, you know, when you're, when you're asking more of your body because starvation, you know, or fasting, you know, however way, whichever way you relate to it is, is a stress on the body. Right. And so it's going to ask more of your thyroid. It's going to ask more of your adrenal glands, which means you're going to be utilizing a little bit more of the, the minerals and things needed to for combustion in those organ and glandular systems. And, and so often it can be related to that. And sometimes, you know, when people are fasting, sometimes they're drinking a ton of water, not mineralizing. And so they're getting all this questionable water, you know, into their body, it's stripping the body of minerals. And, and so you're getting a double whammy with the fasted state plus the, the, the questionable and higher than normal consumption of water. And, um, so I think those are probably the most common reasons. I mean, and then thirdly, I guess would be, you know, as, as you're raising ketones, obviously 
they're coming from somewhere, which means you're breaking down fat. And we all know that toxicity is stored in fat tissue. And so as you eat away at your fat tissue and use it for energy, you're going to start releasing toxicity into the body. And that's, and again, that's just another version of stress. And so, yes, you know, that could be another trigger for epinephrine. It could be triggered for your thyroid gland. It could be triggered for something else that would, would lead to that. But and we've had people go through that without just consulting with us first. And we always say, you know, it's first of all, palpitations usually don't linger. They're, they're there for a period of time to help because your body's trying to get through this acute stress and then it sort of clears. I, I'm curious that you, you've done a ton of fasting. You must have had some of those in your experiences as well. Hey guys, I want you to know what I've been doing for my health that is absolutely transforming it. I'm taking massive amounts of vitamin C. Now, it's not just the regular vitamin C. This is 100% natural and it only contains natural sources, whole foods like amla berry, camu camu berry, uh, cherry. So it's literally just ground up fruits and massive amounts and it delivers 750 percent of your daily recommended vitamin c so i literally double it and i have just seen so many benefits so go to chantalrayway.com slash vitamin c to get yours today yeah i would say the one thing that i do is i I have, I'm anemic, so I ha have low iron. Yeah. So I will, there's some supplements that I take. Um, I have some thyroid issues. So for me, like selenium helps, uh, iron helps. So, and just taking like, a, definitely I take a lot of like sea salt, like Himalayan mm -hmm. pink sea salt. I'll just take it, put it on my hand and just literally lick it. Um, or I, even if I'm doing a water fast, sometimes I'll take like a spoonful of like one spoonful of pickle juice. Yeah. I'll do one tablespoon of that. And I'm like, like, it's I'm like <laughs> well, you know, any tips uh, like that that you have for you? Yeah. You know, one of my, one of my go-tos was, uh, uh, at nighttime because we, I'm Sonia and I always have a tea at nighttime. That was, that's our, that's our like sort of dating ritual at nighttime when we put our kids to bed we have our tea and oh, that's nice. chat with one another and so when i can't do that when i'm fasting I'll, I'll boil up some water and throw some salt in there it tastes like bone broth to me mm. so that's that's one of my little hacks i guess but uh i mean it's you you kind of brought up a well you did you brought up a really important question especially if it's so relatable to you with with your own thyroid experience i mean some of the main reasons why people are anemic or um, you know, they have to add more selenium in their diet or the thyroid's off to begin with is because of heavy metal toxicity or underlying infections that haven't been addressed, right? So, you know, speaking of those types of individuals that have that underlying factor in relation to thyroid, getting into a fast can definitely be more challenging. It, it can be kind of provoking for a little more symptoms and might require a little more handholding. Um, and again, I think that just kind of goes back to a proper support system leading into a fast to try to find as many what we call upstream variables that are interfering with someone's overall health and, um, and before they, you know, go into deeper fasting and also don't want this to sound like it has to be a medical experiment for people to fast because obviously it's built into our very DNA. And, but this is kind of, you know, part of the first conversation, what happens when people hit plateaus? Well, you got to dig a little bit deeper in your own health. You know, I, I tell pe everyone to go with at least on your own and everyone listening, please do this create a health timeline for yourself. So I know when I was a kid, I was like the kid who had the allergies, the eczema, I was allergic to different foods. I was, you know, had the asthma respirator and I had all that stuff when I was a kid. And uh, I mean, that none of that's a part of my story anymore, of course, but you know, what, are, what were your childhood uh, hospitalizations? Were you on the birth control pill? And if you're, if you're a woman, if you, you know, did you have metal fillings? Did you have root canals or other surgeries? Did your tonsils get removed? Like, what does your health history look like for where you are today? Because all those influences have affected you. I mean, where I grew up in, in the Okanagan and up in sort of the border, the Washington border, uh, Washington, British Columbia border, tons of orchards in our area. And I remember running through our orchard fields and running behind the sprayers and like eating apples off the trees right after they've been sprayed. And, you know, we were, we were riddled with toxins in our body in the, in the, in the orchard environment that we lived in. And my parents had a concrete manufacturing plant, which I used to work at every summer and so many chemicals there that I was exposed to. And so part of my own healing story came from diving a little bit deeper, 
checking my heavy metal toxicity levels, checking my food sensitivities, looking at, you know, my hormone functions and looking at all these things because it, it told my health picture and where I needed to focus a little bit more, which, um, which is part of that deeper dive I think we all need to go on. Mm. Um, I know one thing that I was going to ask you, and I just remembered when you were talking about the partial fasting and you were saying have above ground veggies, mm. explain that. So what makes it different for you to have above ground veggies versus ones below that are ground. ground? Yeah. Yeah. Basically, I mean, you're just, you're getting less of the starchy veg, which, which could be a little bit more insulin provoking. And, uh, and cause we, we want sort of, it's sort of like you just want quick fuel and then you want it out of your body mm. versus like a, a sustained fuel source that, you know, you can maybe tap into more or support more of those glycogen stores. We really want depleted glycogen stores as much as we can on a partial fast. And it's just sort of just to tickle you and give you something to look forward to every day. And that's how I look at it. Uh, cause I don't know about you on that, like that day one to day two, it's this, this lack of joy that sets in is is so palpable and but when you're doing a partial fast you always have something to look forward to <laughs> right that's true yeah well let's talk about the metal fillings and the impact of your health have you have you seen anyone that has gotten the metal fillings extracted out of their teeth and oh. how their their life has been impacted with that oh man it's well, it's, it's huge i mean and and everyone's, again, everyone's different. We all have different detoxification pathways, microbiology and whatnot. But I mean, let's take, let's, let, I would go back to the symptoms. First of all, P people typically with metal fillings still in their mouth tend to have weight loss resistance. They tend to have brain fog, uh, energy dips, a little bit slower recovery, maybe slower wound healing, maybe uh, slower bowel movements, uh, insomnia, thyroid issues. I mean, so those are the typical types of neurotoxic complications from mercury. And eventually it can you know, lead to anxiety and, or depression or mental health uh, changes because it's just chronic state of brain inflammation. Um, I mean, I encourage people to, to, to really research this. I mean, mercury off gases at room temperature. So just imagine what's happening in your mouth at 98.6 Fahrenheit for you guys down the States. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, just that heat exposure in the mouth. Then you have an acid environment because all the, the enzymes that are in the mouth are they're causing this leaching. Some people have two different types of metals. And so that creates this galvanic reaction, which, which is like this electrical current that's forcing even more metal out into your mouth. Mm. And then once it, you're in mercury vapor, it's, it's just perforating into all the tissues and the closest surrounding most important tissue is obviously your brain. And so anything downstream from the brain, hormonal, neurological, pain responses, like I said, like that, the, the mysterious fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, I mean, it's all connected to how, is, how well is our brain functioning? Yes. And so, yeah. So when you, when you actually pull out root cause issues, what we call upstream issues, the, the body can finally like stop attacking with its immune system in those areas. And so, especially with like, I mean, thyroid, uh, TPO or uh, thyroid peroxidase antibody and, uh, levels go down significantly, like autoimmune markers drop considerably when those things are just gone because it's just one less thing that the immune system has to deal with. So objectively, and then subjectively, all those symptoms I spoke to, they, they really start to, to mobilize. Mm. Yeah. So do you have like any suggestions for like finding the right dentist who can remove that? Because do you, isn't it pretty important to find someone who kind of specializes in the removal of it? Oh, it's, it's so important. I mean, I, I would encourage it every... Um, like if there's practitioners listening to this, make friends with a dentist that you can trust because they're your, honestly, they're, they're our greatest ally. I mean, we, we have a close relationship with our local dentist for, the, for these reasons. We want people to make sure that when they're getting an extraction, it's done in a safe environment so that, you know, they're not just, oh, you don't want those anymore? We'll just yank them out, no problem. Because a lot of the trouble is that once they're pulled, that's where, that's where you, you potentially could get a big exposure. So we have a very specific detox protocol for people when they're going in to see their dentist. And so that they follow that and then they come back and we do an IV treatment on them with high dose vitamin C to just try to deliver as much of whatever maybe came out in the, in the procedure to be eliminated from the body. So, but tips, you, you gotta, you be your own advocate. You gotta search, you gotta ask, you know, I would look, I would even encourage people to look online for 
type in like proper mercury extraction video and you'll see them like they're fully it's like hazmat suits with proper vacuums and it's right. it's really well taken care of uh and so you you gotta you gotta research uh, i mean i wish there was like this chain of dentists all across north america that you know we could say that's the that's those are the guys you got to go see but it's just not like that it all depends on what area you're in i don't know about you but all my friends like to enjoy a nice glass of wine after a long stressful day but the problem is that all these wines have so many harmful chemicals like pesticides and way too much sugar if you're going to drink wine you should drink dry farm wines their wines are all natural and additive free and they are tested for purity sugar free and low alcohol so you can have the great taste of good wine without all those extra chemicals and as a special gift if you sign up with our link at chantelrayway.com slash wine you can get a bonus bottle of natural wine for just one penny so have that extra bottle of wine for one penny go to chantelrayway.com slash wine or just click the show notes and you'll see the link right there so this has been wonderful. And you guys are in Canada, Vancouver, correct? We're in Vancouver, yeah. 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 So now you can see patients anywhere? Yeah. Like via yeah, we have, Skype or via Zoom or Yeah. Yeah. We 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 see a lot of patients from different different areas in North America and, and beyond. Um and yeah, we coach them on online just like we're we're having a, a wonderful chat right now on Zoom. Now, do you do, are you big on like hair analysis testing? Do you do a lot of blood testing? So if someone wanted to come see you and they said, okay, let's do it via Zoom. Yeah. What, what kind of testing do you kind of are a fan of? Yeah, I, I, here's, my, here's my thing with hair testing. I think it's great. It's great as a, as a one-off status. What I always want to see though is I always, we always want to see a urine test because we want to see before provoking a metal out of your body and then what's happening once we used a provoking agent. That way we can see what's the body doing on its own and what are some sort of ongoing regular exposures that we can see in that urine. And then, the, and then once you take the key later and follow the protocol for collection, now we can see what's actually stuck deeper in the body that wants to come out. So there, there, there's value in all of them. And then you're, you're testing for different types of mercury when you're looking at hair versus urine. And um, there's value in it all, to be honest. I mean. It's just what we use from a protocol point of view. We would want to always see the before and after for your urine point of view. Mm. And so, yeah. And I mean, there's, it's great. I mean, in the U S you guys have got it good because all of our clients uh, that are down the U S I mean, we just, you guys have access to a plethora of different labs through certain websites. So you can download requisitions, go to your local, you know, lab, I think it's called lab core for those blood draws. Uh, a lot of the, the kits, as long as there's a practitioner authorizing, a recommendation for a certain, uh, like say urine test, that's, that's easily shipped out to the patient. So a lot of this stuff, thankfully in this modern age, one of the, one of the benefits is that the, this telemedicine opportunity is quite yeah. palpable, right? All right. I'll ask you one last question and then I'll let you go. So this is one of the things that I struggle with to this day. And even though, and that is constipation. So mm -hmm. any tips that you have for our listeners and including me of what you would say that kind of really helps? Like, what do you see as some of the main causes when people come to you for constipation and what are some of your best fixes for it? Yeah. So uh, the first thing is definitely to f look upstream. So we would want to look at, yeah, I mean, you mentioned thyroid. We got to look at thyroid is you know, it's one thing to support thyroid, but it's another thing to, to actually get that thing working again. And so that's all coming from, from the brain. It's the brain communication to the thyroid. And when that connection's happening, that's usually not a problem. So that's, that would be step one, look upstream, what's interfering with just basic peristalsis, and that's coming from a, a communication stressor. Uh, step two is to you definitely look at food sensitivities. I want to find out what's causing inflammation in the GI tract, which is, which is causing, you know, changes to the microbiology. Uh, that would be definitely step two, uh, from looking from a nutritional point of view. Um, three would be, you know, sometimes this is where sort of symptom management can be supportive. You know, look at uh, you know, increasing magnesium or some other tools like that. Maybe get some colonics um, and, and basically just support 
the typical mechanisms for elimination. And then this is where we like to add in other elimination support. So uh, we like to use infrared saunas or ion cleanse foot baths and things like that to create flow because when there's, when our roots of elimination are sort of clogged, then we got to get at least get the other ones moving at the same time so that we, we can do that and the supportive stuff while we're looking upstream to find out how to get the communication system working again. And that works really well for, I'd say, well, I, we don't really have problems with constipation after people do that kind of stuff. Awesome. Well, I cannot wait to have your wife on. We'll have to have her back on and talk about hormones with us, but this has been amazing. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Yeah. So we're uh, on all the social media. Our website is divineelements.ca. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Sonia and I have a, a YouTube channel called Drs. Nick and Sonia Jensen. Uh, we every every quarter we run a, a program called the Metabolic Fix, which you can find on our Facebook pages. And Dr. Sonia and I are both on Instagram, of course. Dr. Nick Jensen, ND, or Dr. Nick Jensen and Dr. Sonia Jensen. So awesome! Yeah, Chantel, it, I got to say this to you. I mean, the fact that there's more people like you creating such a huge reach with such an important message, I'm so grateful for you because. Yeah. I, would you agree that there's an urgency? Like we need people to know this information. We need people to apply this information. And the fact that you've created this platform, I mean, I'm honored to be able to speak with you on this. So uh -huh. I, I want to acknowledge you too. It's just, this is really Thank important you. stuff that people are listening to. Well, the pleasure has been all mine and you are just a wealth of knowledge. I just, I feel like I have an instant best friend. <laughs> there you go. Reach out, reach out if you need anything. Let me know. Yes. Yeah. So great. And if you have a question that you want answered, yes. go to questions at chantelrayway.com. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.